תודה רבה, דוקטור פינג ופרופסור סער. Switch to English now. We are very happy to continue the tradition of a joint session with our parent organization, the European Society of Cardiology. It is a great pleasure to welcome to our annual national meeting Professor Panos Vardas, the president of the ESC, Professor Fausto Pinto, president-elect of the European Society of Cardiology, and Professor Thomas Lusher, editor-in-chief of the European Heart Journal. All are the most ESC senior leaders. This joint session was organized in order to emphasize the great importance of the ESC for the Israel Heart Society and to strengthen further the already strong ties between our societies. Thank you all very much for being with us in this event. We wish you all a very pleasant stay in our country. So it is my privilege to invite Professor Rosenman and Professor Fausto Pinto, the President-elect of the ESC, to chair the upcoming session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amit. Uh, so uh, it's a privilege uh, for me to invite the first speaker. The first speaker is going to be uh, Professor Thomas Lusher uh, from the University uh, Heart Center in Zurich and the editor-in-chief of the European uh, uh, Heart Journal. The subject of this uh, of the talk is going to be HDL dysfunction. Is raising HDL cholesterol still a therapeutic option? So, Professor Lusher, please. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to come back to Israel and to be part of this uh, prestigious session. Okay. Here are my uh, disclosures. What I'm going to report is actually supported by the Fondation Le Duc, uh, a charity in, located in Paris that funds international uh, collaborative networks together with, uh, we work together with uh, UCLA, uh, Alan Fogelman, Stan Hazen from the Cleveland Clinic, Alan Tall from Columbia, John Deanfield from the University College London, and uh, uh, the uh, Bart Stells from the University of Lille, and uh, Dr. Kubenhoven from the AMC Amsterdam, as well as uh, from our own center who leads this network. Now, HDL metabolism is very complex, uh, and as you can see here, do I have a pointer somewhere? Okay. Okay. As you can see here, the uh, uh, APOA1 is produced in the liver, and that, of course, is a lipoprotein that then takes up lipids from the gut, uh, from uh, circulating monocytes, and uh, is transformed in different forms of HDL uh, and via CTP into VLDL that then again is taken up by the liver. <laughs> now, even in, even in uh, times where all patients have received statins, you can see here from Phil Barter's analysis that the quintiles of HDL remain predictive. And if you have a low HDL, in spite of uh, maximal uh, statin therapy, you still have an increased risk. Therefore, it was considered that HDL may be the new target for unmet clinical needs in the prevention and uh, pri primary or secondary of cardiovascular disease. It was of interest that in uh, the uh, Limona de Garda, they discovered uh, patients or subjects, really, actually individuals that lived uh, up to the, uh, the centenarian age, uh, and in spite of the fact that they used to have actually low HDL. They have then analyzed the uh, HDL of these subjects and discovered the APOA1 Milano, uh, which is a genetically genetic variant of HDL with uh, uh, impressive protective properties. This led to the concept that HDL may actually uh, be a, a protective agent in the cardiovascular system and the vessel wall in particular. 
Uh, it is uh, thought that HDL uh, increases endothelial nitric oxide production, exerts anti-inflammatory effects thereby on the adhesion of uh, adhesion uh, expression of adhesion molecules and uh, monocyte vessel wall interaction, that it stimulates endothelial repair through circulating early EPCs, that it has antithrombotic effects by suppressing tissue factor uh, and also prevents apoptosis. So this made it actually a big candidate, an impressive candidate as a new therapeutic target. Uh, in the, uh, 10 years ago, we did actually infuse uh, APOA1, reconstituted uh, HDL, as we called it, with phospholipids and vitamin E to stabilize it in subjects with hypercholesteremia. And you can see here in the forearm circulation, when we measured endothelial function by infusing acetylcholine, we get a huge increase, of course, in normal subjects uh, in forearm blood flow uh, that uh, is more than tenfold. If you have hypercholesteremia but are cl clinically completely healthy, you get a marked depression in this response. However, when we infused the reconstituted HDL intravenously and after four hours re redid the experiment, we could completely normalize endothelial function, suggesting that at this point, the functional changes are completely reversible upon infusion of reconstituted HDL. This intervention increased HDL actually from 1.2 millimoles to 2.1 millimoles per liter, and flow minute vasodilation, another index of endothelial function that's completely nitric oxide dependent, also was markedly increased. So uh, we proposed, uh, and this uh, was actually taken up in the editorial to our paper in JCI two years ago, that the HDL particle uh, through uh, SRB1 uh, activates uh, the uh, pathway that eventually uh, phosphorylates ENOS uh, at uh, the uh, active uh, activation site 1177, increases NO, reduces monocyte adhesion, and, it, and stimulates endothelial repair. However, <clears throat> when we reproduce these data that clearly show that healthy HDL markedly increases uh, nitric oxide release directly measured by ESR in endothelial cells from, from the aorta of humans, uh, that this is no longer the case in patients with coronary artery disease. Indeed, if you have coronary artery disease, the stimulation effects of HDL on nitric oxide is completely lost. And if you have an acute coronary syndrome, this is even more pronounced. Furthermore, uh, with Christian Besler and the old flunt Messer, we actually looked at the expression uh, of VCAM1, which is an adhesion molecule allowing circulating blood cells to adhere to the vessel wall, a first step uh, in the astrosclerotic process. And as you can see, the inhibition of VCAM by healthy HDL is markedly uh, uh, reduced in, patient, uh, in HDL obtained from patients with stable coronary disease or acute coronary syndrome. And as a consequence, of course, uh, you can see that the endothelial monocyte adhesion is markedly enhanced in these patients contrary to healthy individuals. Now, of course, there's another important aspect of HDL, and that's the prevention of a uh, apoptosis. And here you see the effect of HDL on apoptosis, cap uh, caspase activity, and the next in five. And you can see uh, that indeed uh, we uh, uh, do have uh, when we have healthy HDL, uh, almost no apoptosis. However, HDL from patients with coronary artery disease exhibit uh, still marked uh, apoptosis. So there's a heterogeneity of the HDL particle, obviously. Uh, it can uh, actually contain different proteins and peptides, different lipids, and as we recently learned, also different microRNAs. So it's really a carrier of many uh, mediators in the cardiovascular system, unlike HDL, LDL. And so it's a much more complex uh, particle. And it appears that the contribution of all these different uh, molecules and proteins and lipids and microRNAs differs as we get disease compared to patients that are still healthy. So here you can see the role of caspase-3 uh, uh, and HDL in apoptosis. Uh, this is active uh, uh, caspase-3. 
in HDL from healthy subjects and in those with coronary artery disease. And you can see that there is activation of caspase 3, which is an important mediator of apoptosis in the cardiovascular system. We then did a protein composition analysis uh, in uh, healthy and uh, CAD HDL uh, by uh, uh, Miliano Rivanto and Ulf Lampmes did that in our department. And you can see that some proteins are less uh, uh, contained in uh, uh, these uh, HDL obtained from coronary patients while others are enriched. So there's a huge difference between the protein composition uh, of the two populations. So once we get disease, we take up some proteins and lose others that may change the biological activity of HDL. And indeed, when you look at the, this uh, very uh, uh, graph, you can see that uh, in healthy HDL, endothelial apoptosis is reduced. Now this effect is lost once, once you have coronary artery disease. However, uh, when we add clustering that's uh, reduced in patients with coronary artery disease, we get a dose-dependent uh, regaining of the anti apoptotic effects of HDL, suggesting that the loss of cl cl uh, clustering in HDL from patients with coronary disease is of importance in this context. Furthermore, the APOC3 uh, is enriched in uh, subjects with uh, coronary artery disease and uh, acute coronary syndromes. And you can see that as we get the disease, uh, chronic or acute, there is more APOC3 contained in the HDL particle. Now, when we look at apoptosis, you can see that the endothelial apoptosis is actually, uh, of course, uh, the anti apoptotic effects are reduced, and if you uh, then uh, inhibit APOC3, you can regain the protective effect. There is more to that. The HDL is also important in regeneration, in endothelial repair. And if we take the carotid injury model in the nude mouse, you can see that this is the carotid and this is endothelial denudation in blue. When you add HDL from healthy subjects, there is quicker uh, regeneration than with PBS, which is the control solution. However, if we take HDL from stable patients with coronary disease or ACS, this effect is completely lost. So again, in the HDL dysfunction under these conditions. So there are modifications of the HDL-associated proteins in addition as we get disease. There's inflammation when we get coronary disease, so there's oxidation, chlorination, nitrosylation, displacement, and proteolytic degradation of some components of the HDL particle. In diabetes, there's glycosation, and uh, of course in uremia, there's carbonylation, carbonylation that I don't have to uh, time to show that is the worst of all uh, modifications in this context. Here you can see that uh, if, as you get diabetes, the myeloperoxidase activity is enhanced in the HDL particle uh, measured by two different uh, uh, assays under these conditions. Furthermore, we have also protective uh, enzymes in the HDL particle, in particular uh, peroxidase 1, which uh, inhibits oxidation of lipoproteins under these conditions. Now it is of interest that again, when we compare HDL from coronary patients and ACS, there's a marked decrease in the peroxidase activity, and as a compensation of it, there's an increased expression of the protein, uh, but clearly a dysfunction of this antioxidant protective enzyme within the uh, uh, particle, uh, HDL particle. So when we look at vascular dysfunction uh, and uh, HDL dysfunction and its vascular effects in patients with coronary disease and ACS, that unlike uh, the normal situation, the, uh, the HDL particle as we get disease is modified because of a reduced PON1 activity. It will then bind also to the LOX1 receptor, which why a protein kinase beta1 will actually uh, um, uh, phosphorylate ENOS at the deactivation site, uh, threonine 495, and therefore there will be less nitric oxide, more monocyte adhesion because of the, uh, increased expression of adhesion molecules, reduced endothelial repair, increased thrombogenicity because of increased tissue factor expression, and increased apoptosis. So therefore, it is the question 
uh, should we raise HDL uh, cholesterol for cardiovascular prevention? There have been several uh, uh, proposals, lifestyle, drugs, HDL, memetics, and others. Now, lifestyle, you know, uh, that uh, does increase uh, HDL if you run or if you don't want to run, uh, if you take some Bordeaux, uh, you may have higher HDL. Whether this is protective, we don't know at this point. However, drugs have been uh, uh, emphasized, and particularly niacin, which is the oldest drug uh, to modify lipids already used in the 50s, has been tested in the AIM High trial published in the New England Journal uh, a few uh, years ago. And you can see here the cumulative event rate over a five-year period. And uh, the niacin plus the statin did not change the event rate compared to placebo plus a statin, which was a big disappointment of the investigator. Now, what uh, does this uh, mean? Now, at this point, there was the question whether there were troubles with the AIM High trial. Was it underpowered with about 2,000 patients only? The statin dose was not comparable to match for the lipid levels. This was a major problem in the design of this trial. And the question was also, is HDL still dysfunctional? And therefore, it would not work under these conditions if you just increase it. And maybe the whole concept is not workable. There was then, of course, the HBSC2 Thrive trial, which was announced by Merck. It's a 20,000 patient trial. It's laroprobant and niacin to prevent the flushes. We published the event rates, the trial design, and the pre-specified and liver outcomes that showed that there were quite a few side effects uh, under these conditions. However, what's more important is, of course, the uh, clinical outcome under these conditions. And Merck had to announce uh, early on that uh, Trebleptif, the modified release niacin, and the Laroprid did not achieve the primary endpoint. So again, a failure of an HDL raising uh, strategy. Then, of course, came another concept when we look at the metabolism of HDL that I just showed. And one option is to inhibit CTP to sort of uh, increase HDL because then you prevent its transformation in VLDL and its uptake by the liver. Now, early on the uh, uh, trial, uh, the Illuminate trial in 2008 was uh, published, and uh, you, the changes in lipids were really impressive. You could see a huge increase in a, uh, HDL and still a marked reduction in LDL. So basically, you should live forever with such a lipid profile. But unfortunately, this was not the case. In fact, there was an increase in mortality, and the, the uh, uh, patients with an event were 25% more frequent in the torsetropepa torva group compared to the, uh, the torva alone group in a substantial number of patients. What was the problem? Torsetropepa increased aldosterone release and therefore also increased blood pressure. It reduced nitric oxide and increased endothelin uh, production in the vessel wall. And here are the data of the latter, uh, published by Branko-Simic from our group. You can see here the aortic endothelium content was increased in torsetropib, significantly treated animals, while the aortic enos expression was significantly reduced. So in addition to aldosterone, fibrosis, uh, uh, cardiovascular remodeling, and hypertension, there was also a vascular effect of torsetropib that was very unfortunate. We then went on with a new compound which did not have these uh, uh, properties, and that's dalcetropib. And in the first study, we randomized around 500 patients to placebo and dalcetropib over a 36-week period and measured flow-mitted vasodilation as an index of endothelial function. And here is the uh, principle. There's a one-minute baseline. Then the cough is inflated. You induce ischemia and post-ischemic hyperemia then will lead, of course, to a dilatation that's completely nitric oxide dependent of the brachial artery. Unfortunately, well, first of all, the, the lipid changes over 36 weeks were less pronounced than with torsetropib. There was about a 30% increase in HDL and APOA1 and no change in LDL and uh, its lipoprotein. However, unfortunately, 
and the tail function did not change significantly over the 36-week period. We presented that at the board of Roche, but they still continued large trials, in fact two of them, a HOPE type and an ACS trial, and uh, they were conf uh, confident that because there was no change in systolic and diastolic blood pressure, in contrary to torcetropib, that the drug will work in this patient populations. However, the trial was then er stopped early and published in the New England Journal of Medicine and delcetropib in patients with a recent acute coronary syndrome, unfortunately, did not change at all uh, the outcome. You can see the event rates are spot on over a three-year period. And there was, were enough events uh, uh, to actually make a good uh, uh, statement about the uh, effectiveness of another CTP inhibitor under these conditions. Now the last hope in CTP is now anisretropib, and you can see here the first trial, the DEFINE trial, also published in New England, where LDL was reduced by about 40 percent and HDL increased by 140 percent. And this, of course, led to the hope that under these conditions, uh, with changing both uh, lipoproteins in a favorable fashion, uh, we will have a po positive event rate when we try this uh, in a large trial. So the HPA3 revealed trial is now on the way, recruiting 20,000 uh, plus patients to determine whether anisotropic, the last hope of CTP inhibition, will indeed impact on clinical outcome. So the last thing I would like to talk about is the HDL memetics, and I told you already that we have infused APOA1 uh, in patients with hypercholesteremia. We then repeated the, the, the whole study in patients with acute coronary syndrome, with Remy Scheminar in our uh, department, and you can see that uh, there was no change whatsoever of endothelial function in patients with acute coronary syndrome, suggesting that APOA1, when infused in patients with acute coronary syndrome, takes up all the bad stuff in its, uh, to, to carry it in, its, in the circulation and loses, therefore, completely its vascular protective effects. This was actually confirmed recently with a trial that's just online as of this week uh, by Jean-Claude Tardif uh, and many others. The effects of the high-density lipoprotein mimetic agent CIR001 on coronary atherosclerosis in patients with acute coronary syndromes, a randomized trial. And again here, unfortunately, uh, the uh, trial was completely neutral. So high-density lipoprotein is a very complex molecule. It serves different properties in the circulation. It has very pr uh, imp uh, impressive protective effects in healthy individuals uh, by taking up uh, lipids from the gut and um, uh, circulating macrophages, bringing it back to the liver, uh, and uh, uh, therefore, uh, importantly, uh, uh, driving reverse cholesterol transport. In addition, on endothelial cells, it has many protective effects like nitric oxide release, anti-inflammatory effects, anti-thrombotic effects, and anti-apoptotic effects. Unfortunately, as we get disease, the carrier takes up all kinds of uh, uh, proteins and loses others, uh, changes its lipid composition, and takes up microRNAs, which unfavorably affect its biological effectiveness. Therefore, I would say uh, to conclude that if you just increase HDL in patients with the, who already have the disease, you may actually do damage uh, to your patients. So when it, uh, we uh, would like to uh, uh, pursue this strategy further, we would also need to change the biological properties of HDL, not just its plasma levels. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. <laughs>